I'm George Gilbert. We're here downtown uh, San Francisco at the Daybricks office. Um, we've got a special guest with us today, Matei Zaharia, creator of Apache Spark and co-founder of Databricks. Matei, welcome. Thanks, George. So um, let's, let's start out at a high level. Mm -hmm. um, lots of discussion um, with you and, and other members of the Spark team are about these amazing APIs that you've got. Let's, let's bounce up a level and, uh -huh. and talk about um, the types of apps people have been building for 60 years batch, interactive, and now there's a new type. Mm -hmm. um, tell us where that fits in, continuous applications. Yeah, great, yeah. So we're talking after seeing um, a lot of the use cases of, of uh, Apache Spark and also yeah. uh, other data processing frameworks, uh, we've kind of introduced this name of continuous applications to, to cover something that um, everyone is already trying to do, basically, which is applications that uh, integrate um, real-time data as it arrives into a complete end-to-end uh, -end system. Uh, so basically, um, it's not just uh, computing on a stream and outputting another stream, it's actually integrating it into a system like, say, um, recommendation engine or uh, some kind of alerting system, you know, credit card fraud detection, something like that, where many, uh, many people interact through the same computer system. Okay, so um, let's drill down a little bit and, and talk about how um, you still need batch processing mm -hmm. and interactive or, or request mm -hmm. response, but with the addition of, of stream processing, how does that make a continuous mm -hmm. app? Yeah, so, so the main, the, the main um, idea we have here is that um, basically applications that process real-time data still uh, cover many forms of processing. So even if you have real-time data coming in, that's usually not all your data. You also have some other data sitting on the side that's maybe static or maybe you update it every night or something like that and you combine it. And likewise, even though maybe you're computing some stuff just on the stream, like for each item that comes in, compute something that comes out, you probably also have people in the loop that are doing interactive queries, uh, you know, the, that come in uh, and, and change the workload that say, oh, we should be running this other thing on the stream and so on. So our observation was basically that a lot of the computer systems out there today that people used to build these just focus on one aspect, like just the streaming part or just the interactive queries or just the batch part. But really, um, the, the, the developers and organizations using them are trying to build this end-to-end -end application. So we want to design uh, APIs where you can combine these end-to-end -end pieces and have you know something like a recommendation system where people can interactively tweak the recommendations or something like that. And and by to use this example to extend it, yeah, um, it would mean like the recommendation system would update itself in real time, not yeah. like overnight and say, okay, exactly. here's some new movies for you. Yeah, it would update itself in real time, but it, it would be integrated with other things you want to do with that system. Like if someone comes in and just wants to ask a question about the current uh, state of it, like, oh, how many recommendations did we make for this? item, you could go in and do that through your standard interactive query tools. Or if someone wanted to say, hey, bring in this static data set, it's not a real-time data set, but it is relevant to these recommendations, uh, it would be possible to put that in there as well. Oh, so, all right, so summing it up now at the level of the APIs that make yes. Spark so great, it's you're adding an API um, that goes along with batch yep. and goes along with interactive so that these applications um, can be built in a yes on a, in a consistent foundation. fashion. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, we're doing for people familiar, uh, uh, you know, with the Spark APIs, we're using um, data frames and, and Spark SQL as as the same kind of API that that can extend into batch streaming or interactive processing. So anything that makes sense in that API will know how to do it at these three levels of, of latency basically and all the results will be consistent and all of them will be possible to combine in your, in your application. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm gonna come drill down on that actually with um, um, mm -hmm. uh, Michael, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so now let's, let's drill a little bit into some sort of terminology that may or may not be familiar with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, we heard for years about this Lambda architecture, mm -hmm, yeah. which was a, um, at the time, it was a time to try and combine sort of stream processing and batch processing. Yeah. And now it's sort of, 
you know, pejoratively sort of termed a bit of a hack. Mm -hmm. how, how does structured streaming in Spark 2.x um, get around that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, yeah. So the Lambda architecture uh, basically came out when um, there were many sort of batch processing systems for large data sets, and there weren't that many real-time ones. And the first uh, real-time ones were starting to be built, but they didn't have um, very strong guarantees necessarily about what they'll compute, you know, how they'll react to faults and so on. So the idea of the Lambda architecture was, you know, you receive data periodically, and we know how to run batch jobs to get a result, and like the batch jobs are completely sort of consistent and correct and fault tolerant, they'll always give like the right answer, but they're really slow. So we're gonna do that, you know, say every few hours, and then we're going to have a second layer, like a second copy of the computation that uses one of these fast but less, um, you know, like less accurate uh, streaming systems to, to give us some streaming results. And so we're going to fill in with those streaming results uh, when the data is new, and then later we're going to replace them with the batch ones. That was the idea. And the idea was like, okay, how do we write applications so we can reuse some of the code across these? How do we make this switch, like when you switch to the, the batch version and so on? Um, does that make sense as so to what it was? This was? There was a fair amount of complexity and you, yeah. you, there was a fair amount of error because yeah. the last bit of data was coming from the fast system, exactly, which yeah. didn't have the enterprise availability and resilience. Yeah, exactly, and it, it could change under you or it could just uh, miscount things because of the way, uh, basically because of the trade-offs that these systems uh, made. Um, and so it's, if, you, if you're just trying to do something like, you know, just a rough approximation of something, you know, how many people are looking at this thing on social media, which is actually like where uh, this architecture kind of came out of, uh, then it's, it's probably fine. It's an easy way to put these together. But basically when people start doing that, they quickly run into, um, into challenges when the results don't match. So um, something we saw at a lot of companies actually is they, they built a uh, real-time streaming sort of pipeline and they showed customers, they told them, you know, hey, now you can see some metric uh, in real time isn't that cool? And then they had the batch pipeline that calculated the exact results and you know, sent them a report every night or sent them a bill. And then the customer would say, well, hey, I was looking at your streaming thing at five o'clock. It said there were you know, 10,000 users on my video, but now you charge me for 11,000 users. <laughs> What's up with that? Um, so this is, this is the kind of problem that can, uh, that can come up. Okay, so, so let's take that into a, um, as you were, you know, a particular application. Let's maybe talk about fraud prevention. Uh huh. Yeah. And you, you know, um, you don't have to do the two separate pipelines, fast and, and yes. big. Um, how would it change how you build a fraud prevention app? Not and actually not just how you would build it, but its capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah. So yeah. So when you use um, uh, when you use um, continuous applications and, and structured streaming uh, in Spark 2.0, the the main thing about them is that uh, they're designed to give the the same set of results, so consistent results across the two things, regardless of whether you have failures, whether um, you know some data arrives late, things like that. Um, they, they'll give you the the same kind of consistent result, and in the same application. You you can therefore combine them, and no matter which one you got the result from, you know you can you can build on top of it. Um, so, to 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 to, to go to this fraud um, uh, detection case, um, what it lets you do is if you have some um, you know kind of complex uh, algorithm or report that you uh, run every night, and you want to run that um, in a in a streaming fashion as data arrives, the system will make sure you get the same result as you would have from that one, or it tells you, oh, I don't understand how to run this in a, in a streaming fashion. The second thing it lets you do is it lets you easily combine um, kind of static data, you, you update rarely using batch jobs with the real-time data, and the same way you, you programmed uh, uh, an application that, that uses that static data, you can now um, apply it on, on the real-time data. So as we look out um, uh -huh. several quarters and, and we see the maturation of structured streaming uh -huh. um, and, and, and the integration perhaps of uh, machine learning, yeah. would that mean that we are able to do a better job of um, catching the new fraud patterns 
and rolling them into the application? Yeah, yeah. Basically, the, the uh, I'd say that kind of two or three things that it enables you to do. First, you'll be able to use uh, the same sophisticated algorithms you would use on static data and and run them on a on a stream and and get you know the the same results. The results that make sense. You don't have to worry about do my results mean something else in the streaming version than the batch version. Um, second, you'll be able to do you'll be able to use the other pieces of Spark, such as interactive queries, uh, on the, the the state of your um, of your real time application. So a really common one with with fraud detection is uh, okay. We denied some uh, credit card transaction or some some application for some some uh, customer, and then the customer calls us and asks us why. And now you know most most organizations have a totally different system where analysts on the phone can drill into the data and can say, oh, I think it's because you have this or that. Uh, in this case, you'll be able to build that into the same application and get the same consistent view. You don't have to worry about, did the data that I used to deny the application make it into my customer response uh, database? Or like, will my customer app be confused because they don't see why it was denied? So it's almost like there were two there yeah. were two almost distinct parts to the application. Yeah. One was the big data, and one was the fast data, the current yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now they're the same. Yeah, exactly. Or in some cases, they even see there's like the interactive one. There's like, oh, let's periodically put this stuff into a data warehouse, and then okay. people on the phone can like, you know, fill in some forms and and request the records for this customer. So it's all about like logically what the what the the, the credit card um, uh, you know company wants to do is they want to have a, a single application with these different facets, the streaming, the, uh, the, the interactive, and the batch. But then, because they only have systems that can do one at a time, they're forced to build these different systems. And then it's their job to keep them in sync. And that's really hard. And, and when it breaks, it, it also breaks in, in ways that are very hard to, 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 diagnose. to diagnose. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, with that, let's. Um, uh, close out our look at uh, Spark 2.0 and continuous apps, and then we'll come back with a look at the roadmap. <laughs>